Local programming on KRWG made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. This is KRWG TV Radio Online, news that matters. Next on Newsmakers, the international reaction to President Donald Trump. We'll hear what some Australians think about the new administration. Plus a conversation with KRWG's Simon Thompson, who hails from Australia. Why did he come to the United States and would he make the same decision today? Thanks for joining us on Newsmakers, I'm Fred Martino. On election night, many countries of the world watched in disbelief as Donald Trump won the presidency with surprise victories in states that allowed him to best Hillary Clinton in the Electoral College. Countries have since been scrambling to assess where they stand with the U.S. diplomatically, in trade agreements and in shared societal values. KRWG's Simon Thompson took to the streets of his homeland to get Australians' reaction to the election of Donald Trump. I spent about two hours in my home city, Melbourne, speaking to friends and acquaintances about the election of Donald Trump. I think it's pretty shocking that he is America's president after all the that he's been caught saying and doing. I think it's kind of scary and makes me worried about the future of the world. And I think it's a strange choice for the American people to elect that man. Just all of the, the shit he's got himself into. The pussy grab and the, you know, I've lost count of all the stupid shit he said to offend and shock people. And yet he's still got the <laughs> highest, you know, the, the most important job in the world. I was shocked and pretty disappointed, very disappointed and then pretty fearful. That was Molly Kelly, Thomas Millier and Katrina Sofo, three Australians out on one of Melbourne's restaurant strips on a Friday afternoon. So why are people a world away in Australia concerned about the results of the US election? The US is Australia's closest military ally and sets trade policy with China, the country that receives the bulk of Australia's exports. To have Trump elected almost means that we have Trump elected. So it's, that's why it's extra scary, I see it as extra scary. Australian broadcast media gave twice as much coverage to the US election as it did to its own election, according to media monitoring company Ascentia. We seem to follow America almost blindly without questioning what it would do to the Australian people. Thomas Millier is concerned about the impact Trump's presidency is likely to have on climate change and the environment, especially because of his criticisms of the Paris Climate Accord. Food shortages, weather change patterns, soil degradation, biodiversity lost, sea level rise, uh, refu environmental refugees moved on by sea level rise, millions of them. And then that kind of counters against the policies that these conservative governments are putting up around the world where they're not accepting more refugees. Katrina Sofo volunteers as an advocate for Australian asylum seekers and immigrants. She says she's concerned about how Trump's immigration rhetoric could impact policy here in Australia and around the world. When um, the Australian government's trying to make a case for something, they'll use that it's working in America as an example. So uh, harsher immigration policies. I mean, we still have some horrendous policies, probably worse than you guys at the minute, but I think having someone like Trump in power and representing the values that we're trying to fight, a lot of, uh, a lot of the Australian community are trying to fight. I think it's going to make it harder for change to happen here. Molly Kelly says on a symbolic level, the election of Donald Trump is a step backward for gender equality in Australia and the world over. As a woman, of course, I think he's a complete <laughs> head and I find him to be extremely politically incorrect and ex extremely offensive towards women. Warren Thompson lives in the Melbourne inner city. He's also my dad. Having worked in international business, he's concerned about Australian diplomatic and trade relations with China in the Trump world. The geopolitics is bigger than any individual and I don't think he's shown any sign of understanding that uh, a dispute between America and China serves no one's interests. 
A poll by the Lowy Institute taken before the election showed half of Australian respondents said Australia should distance itself from the United States if it elects a president like Mr Trump. Only 11% said they would prefer Trump to Clinton on foreign policy. But for many Australians, including Molly Kelly, Katrina Sofo and my dad, the outcome of the election and low voter turnout is just the logical result of a political system that hasn't made the civil duty of voting compulsory among its citizens. Make people vote and then maybe it would, would have been different. You're going to be forced to pay taxes and forced to do other, you know, social responsibilities. Voting in who leads the country is a huge one. It is not too much to ask people to participate in their democracy. Democracy can be taken for granted, but I believe it's a very delicate flower. And unless it's looked after and nurtured, it can disappear very quickly. And that would be devastating. And there aren't too many genuine democracies in this world, and we can't afford to lose them. For KRWG from Melbourne, Australia, I'm Simon Thompson. And Simon joins us in studio now. And of course, we should mention, Simon, you were on uh, holiday vacation in Melbourne, your hometown, and you had your personal audio recorder. That's why it's not video. Mm -hmm. We had a lot That's of great correct. photos, though. Yes, yes, I did. I had a good holiday. And a, and a lot of interesting comments. Tell me about the reaction to what you heard. We only heard a small part, I'm sure, of what you heard. Uh, but you heard a lot more. What, what were you thinking when you heard all these comments about the, the president of the United States uh, now, Donald Trump. They, most people were just stupefied by the fact that America chose Donald Trump, the fact that he was a reality TV star, um, and they were stupefied that you know our closest trading partner, our closest military ally, was going to be making these huge decisions that you know affect us immensely, but we also have almost no control over. You know we're pretty insignificant in a lot of ways to the you know geopolitics of the world so I mainly think, yeah, just stupefied. I think it's important that you mention you know, it, it could affect Australians because many people may not realize that Australia is not just a, a very close ally but Australia has been with the United States in every single war. Since World War II. Yeah. Every single one. So you know the visa that I'm here on was based on Australia's decision to go to I think the Gulf War um, um, to be part of the coalition of the willing, um, various Gulf Wars. So, you know, even that, um, you know, even pop culture wise, you know, as a young man, I got a lot of my pop culture from the US, TV shows, you know, hip hop, music, everything, you know, we really look to the US like an older brother almost, you know, we kind of looked at the US, they kind of, you know, they make the mistakes and they also get the glory. So we learn from their mistakes, we learn from their successes. We watch the US do it first and then we do it or, or we don't do it for the reasons that you know, the US didn't have success with something. Do you think this uh, election will have a lasting change uh, on how Australians view the United States and even our, our uh, system of, of democracy here? <sighs> Good question. Um, you know, to be fair, I've lived in the US for a while. Um, I've resided here for a while. And I think the Australians and a lot of people globally have a negative image of Americans that maybe isn't quite justified. Americans uh, are, you know, very forward thinking, innovative people. And, you know, your reputation you have outside the US is, is being ignorant, poorly educated, uh, speak before you think kind of people. But I don't think that's the case. But Trump's election, I think for a lot of Australians at least, reinforces that, um, unfortunately. And the kind of second part of your question, I don't think, everyone's kind of, it's a big question mark. Everyone's kind of watching to see what actually happens. And the past two weeks have seen some pretty bold things happen and it's, it's confirming a lot of people's uncertainties and fears, basically. Yeah. You know, I find, found it interesting in what we heard uh, from your interviews in the story that we heard both discussed over some of Trump's uh, comments and his demeanor, as well as comments about policies. And particularly the, the young women were very, very disgusted by some of the, the comments during the campaign. Yeah, I mean, the rhetoric, I mean, you just can't speak about women like that in Australia. Um, and so candidly, you know, I think some of the stuff, some of the tape that didn't make it to air 
was, you know, people like that, and people speak, think like that, and conservatives think like that in Australia, but, you know, to say it out loud and on tape publicly to tweet it would be, you know, committing political suicide in a lot of cases. So the concern is that, you know, this gives more of a license to people who think like that to speak like that. As Meryl Streep said, you know, um, disrespect, I think, invites disrespect. I'm not yeah. sure exactly if that's a quote, but that was the sentiment of what she said. Yeah. And your report mentions something that I bet will surprise a lot of people. It surprised me. I mean, I knew that there was, there was great interest in Australia uh, about what's happening in the U.S., but I never would have guessed that our election was actually covered more by the Australian media than Australia's election. Yeah, that was a surprise to me, too. Um, I mean, I think it says something about, you know, Australia's... You know, our, our two major parties are very similar at the moment. So, I mean, yeah, it's, it, it's, it, it's a crazy election. It was a lot of surprises. Um, but also just in general, as I mentioned earlier, you know, what happens in the US sets the tone for globally, but especially for a Western English speaking country. I mean, it's huge. And also, you know, we're so close to China and, you know, obviously the US, especially with Trump's kind of what, it, what he's said about China, it's going to have such a big impact. So we're really concerned, but also taking notice, yeah. and paying attention. Puts, puts Australia in a difficult position, for sure. Uh, some have said that. Um, I really think Australia doesn't really have much choice, but just to kind of follow and kind of make suggestions and kind of, you know, we're just so small. If you look at us on a military scale, you know, look at China's population, the size of their army, even Indonesia, we are a loss without a strong ally. And before the US came into the picture, our strong ally was the UK. So I yeah. just think it puts us in a precarious situation, but I don't think there's, we don't have much of a choice. Yeah. So take me back, Simon, this is not easy to do, but take me back about a decade and tell me uh, how your interest in, in coming to America began as a college graduate. Good question. Um, so I was really interested in a lot of things, um, especially music and hip hop culture and just a lot of music from the South. Uh, jazz, you know, if you look at the US, is a powerhouse when it comes to pop culture. A lot of fantastic music, innovative music comes from the US. Um, so I was very interested in that. And there was a, a special visa program that was introduced by Barack Obama, allowing for university graduates who you know, if you got into the US within a year of graduation, you could get a year working visa in the US. And, you know, there was that happened, but there was also this kind of sentiment of Barack Obama. I mean, most people didn't really fully understand what he was about, but it was pretty amazing that a black president, there was a black president had been elected. So there was this kind of very positive image of America as being a little bit more uh, educated and thoughtful than maybe that reputation, that negative reputation I mentioned earlier that I don't think is justified, um, you know, kind of changed people's opinions. So President Obama had a dramatic effect. Yeah, I mean, and, and not just for you, you said to me, right? I mean, I was a university grad, so I probably wasn't that informed, but a lot of the musicians I listened to really thought that he was amazing. Like there's a guy called Jim Ward who plays in a band called At The Drive-In, who's, who's ironically, interestingly enough, from El Paso, but he, um, he was on a radio station talking about how, how cool Obama was. And then there was like, uh, who else was talking about him? There's this poet called Sol Williams, who's a hip hopper, who had this poem and the punchline of what the poem was Obama. So I was like, wow, this is so cool. And so, I mean, I didn't really know what his policies were about, but there was just this air of kind of excitement and positivity, I guess, that as carried there, over from, from what was here as well. Yeah, as there was in the United States, but I'm not sure a, a lot of people, uh, unless they have friends or family in other countries, knew how dramatic his influence was about, in other countries, how, how people viewed the U.S. Yes, yeah, certainly. I mean, it was just a surprise. It was just a surprise. You know, there was a lot of... Uh, you know, we went to all your wars, to the US's wars. So when George Bush, you know, kind of was leading those wars in the Middle East, Australia was there. And, you know, we had our own questions, these weapons of mass destruction that raised doubts for us. But, you know, once again, there's a obligation to go for us because it's strategically and diplomatically um, beneficial for us to do that. So. Yeah. So this is, a, this is a very difficult question, I realize. But if you were graduating today, uh, in Australia, how would you feel about coming here? 
I don't think, I think with the rhetoric, especially with, you know, what's happened in the last two, three weeks in terms of like the Muslim ban, questions over visas, there's certainly not a feeling of wanting, you know, like I said with that earlier stuff with Obama, there was a real sense of like, oh, they want Australians to go over there. They, they want to kind of open the doors. Um, they like us. Maybe it's just because we, we spend all our money there or something. I don't know. But there's not a sense of like, you know, that immigrants are wanted or foreigners or that there's this one of, there's, there's this kind of isolation element to it that, you know, the U.S. is for the U.S., I guess, when, you know, that's, that's the U.S.'s choice. But, um, but I'm not sure I would come, to be honest. I'd probably maybe rethink it or maybe do a bit more research or, um, I mean, maybe I'd come just out of wanting to be a journalist. I mean, it's yeah. a pretty fascinating place. And like I said, as an Australian, you know, they're leading a lot of things and, you know, Australia looks to the U.S. like an older brother. And let me ask you about that, uh, being a journalist and uh, doing great work here at, at KRWG. Um, this, this is a difficult position for all journalists, I think, because uh, we're not used to covering individuals who, in the case of, of President Trump now, uh, has said that we're the opposition, uh, actually use the word opposition. Um, calls reporting fake news when it doesn't agree necessarily with the political statements that have been made. Tell me about how you see that for you as a reporter now in the future covering the administration and how it will affect the borderland. I think two things. I think on one count it kind of raises the stakes. You know, there's obviously, you know, there's more consequences of um, you know, reporting your work. So it forces put you in a position where you have to be more thorough, checking, rechecking facts, you know, um, being more professional, being more dynamic, um, giving more context, mm -hmm. explaining things more thoroughly and more in you know, a more engaging way to reach people. But yeah, I mean, the, the second thing, it really pushes us to need to in innovate mm -hmm. and kind of reach more people, you know, Sometimes, you know, in public media, you can feel like you're preaching to the converted. So there's a kind of desire to kind of reach more people. You know, I, I do work with students at Las Cruces High School, and you know, it's really shown me how important that is to give students or teach media literacy. So it's not enough to do a good report. It's more important to show someone how to value news, to evaluate the credibility, to you know, in reporting and consuming it. You know this is a fair report, this is biased, this is unfair, you know, like anything, you know, you want to multiple sides of the story, depending on what it is, what it is, or you want to give context to why this is focused on one perspective. But, Your yeah. report ends with a reminder that Australia has mandatory voting, and the people that you spoke with say uh, the lack of, of mandatory voting in the U.S. paved the way for someone like Donald Trump to win the Electoral College. Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting to compare. This is almost like an argument that I, I not an argument, but a discussion that I have with Americans and they, most, most of them find it to be an infringement on somebody's liberty to make you vote. But for us, it's just, it's, for us in Australia, it's kind of a no brainer. You know, it'd be like saying you, you shouldn't have to pay taxes or you shouldn't have to wear, a, you know, shouldn't have to be made wear a seat belt it just seems to, to us and to me, you know, this is my, my where I'm from, um, to be a no-brainer. I mean, it's the most important job in America. It's the most, arguably the most important job in the world. And to have someone kind of not rock up to, you know, make a determining decision on that is just, it just seems yeah. so uh, reckless. I mean, and then I t have friends in Chicago who went and protested Trump, but I'm like, I spoke to you a week ago and I, I know you didn't vote. So it just seems like a mismatch or a kind of, it just doesn't make sense to me. I mean, it, yeah. yeah. And, you know, uh, to, to give some perspective to this, uh, fewer than 60% uh, of those eligible to vote in the U.S. Uh, cast a ballot in this last election, which means that fewer than 30% of Americans voted for Donald Trump, who are eligible to vote, which gets to your point. I mean, essentially to have the highest office in the land. In the uh, world. And in the world, <laughs> you, would, you would argue. Uh, fewer than 30% of those eligible. Yeah. Choosing I mean, that person. It's, it's I, I don't know, it's just not, I, I can, 
uh, it's just very fascinating from a maybe even just like a historic kind of or anal academic level to analyze Americans' attitudes towards compulsory voting because you know uh, a lot of people are really against it, but it just seems like it could be the antidote to so many issues. You know, you look at um, things like voter suppression. Um, you know, how much work people use get into on both sides of politics to get people out to vote, but it's just, if you make it mandatory, it's just not an issue. Just Australia's election in 2013, I think we had 93% voter turnout. So yeah, it just seems yeah. like an Most people But you know, I respect the, you know, this, there's different cultural differences um, and that is one of them. And uh, you know, that's, that's if Americans don't want to vote or don't think Americans should be made to vote, then yeah, well, that's the consequence. That's of, it. Yeah. So, and, and I should, as a point of disclosure, mention that I'm on the election advisory committee in Doniana County. So we encourage people to register to vote and to vote. And in a public service campaign, we talk about it as a responsibility of, of citizenship, which I assume was the origins in Australia of, of mandatory voting. And can I just say, I just feel like a bit of a hypocrite. Last election, <laughs> I got actually fined for not voting. Yeah. Uh, so just how you know, much was the fine? Do you remember? Been over two hundred Australian yeah, dollars. So you, you need pretty to substantial. About two hundred bucks. So you yeah. you had to you had to do an absentee ballot, obviously. If and uh, you yes, should have done I should an absentee have done ballot. That, yep. mm -hmm. So. Uh, before getting into journalism, uh, you spent some time teaching English in Mexico City. Tell me about that. Yeah, it was tough. Um, it was pretty interesting. There was a massive desire for, you know, if you're a Mexican and you're at a university, you have to do a thesis in English. That's just like every, every university, good, mediocre, the, the lowest. So there's a massive demand for learning English. Um, and you know, a lot of Mexicans are looking at going to Canada as a report we did with KRWG, going to Canada, Australia, Germany. So when I was there, people wanted to learn Australian English, which is pretty much like American or English English or British English, but there was a lot of Australian slang I was teaching. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, it was really interesting. Um, as you have uh, a lot of young people from Mexico go to Australia. Yeah, after mm -hmm. I had graduating. students that go there yeah. and they, they really like it. And there was this kind of repeated kind of notion that they felt like they were, they blended in more in Australia as the reality, but they didn't have maybe the negative connotations. A lot of middle-class Mexicans resent the, the whole connotation of being looked at like a border jumper, mm -hmm. someone stealing jobs, someone cleaning someone's house or taking care of kids, like rich people's kids. Yeah, so and, let me, kind of the element. And, and let me ask you about, about this, uh, President uh, Trump's rhetoric about building a wall uh, taxing goods uh, from Mexico, demonizing immigrants. What what do you think this will mean for our our relationship with Mexico and the Mexican people? Gosh, um, I mean, obviously not good. I think you know Mexicans are you know like most many immigrants make a really good contribution. They work pretty hard. They have very similar values to Americans. They're family orientated. They're more often than not Christians, so they blend in pretty well. But like just as I mentioned, they'll look at going to other places um, in terms of trade, just kind of a poisoning of the well, um, less opportunities. But yeah, I mean, that they are, that I don't think the relationship and the sentiment between the US and Mexico was that great to begin with. And it may be, the positive is it's being kind of voiced and it's kind of can be dealt with accordingly because it's now out there, but you know, yeah. In a broader sense, I want to ask you another question. President Trump, as you know, uh, has uh, gone in the opposite direction in terms of reaching out to other countries. It's, mm -hmm. it's actually s instead saying, and he, he did this in, you know, in his inauguration, saying America first, using yep. the term America first. How do you think that's received in other countries? I mean, I think America was already America first in a lot of respects, but I think it's maybe not that positive a rhetoric when it comes to things like Europe. Like it's really concerning with the NATO agreement. Um, you know, that would be an element of the America first. You know, US, the US not putting resources into upholding the NATO agreement when that's a key kind of relationship that's positive for holding back Russia. Um, and that's like, a, you know, when you look at Russia's involvement in the US election kind of hacking and helping, some would argue helping determine results or Having it, having a hand in it, I guess it's pretty concerning. Um, and also, you know, there's the historic element of America First, which is goes back to World War II, which is a kind of 
has a racist connotation. I yeah. Guess. So, so big concerns about that uh, on a more specific level to your home country, to Australia. Last week, there was news that President Trump had a terse phone call with Australian uh, Prime Minister uh, Malcolm Turnbull. Uh, this shocked many uh, people, and I know that you said there was a lot going on on your social media accounts. Yeah, about this. it was. I mean, it was just bizarre for a lot of Australians. It just we was kind of shocked. You know, it came on the newscast, maybe even in America, maybe four or five times. Just that we're so close to America. I mean, in so many ways, militarily, almost subservient in, in a lot of ways, militarily, in terms of trade, culture-wise. And for him, you know, our leader's a very articulate, um, articulate man. He's on the conservative right side of politics. Um, you know, we have policies that line up with the US. And for them to have a blowout, I mean, if you can't get on with the Prime Minister of Australia, uh, I don't, it's pretty concerning that he can't, you know, who, who he might have to get on with someone who has totally different values, uh, you know, political leanings or uh, political agendas. So it's really concerning and it's, it's kind of laughable, you know, our prime minister actually came off pretty well out of it, but yeah, I mean, it's just, it was pretty funny in a lot of respects too, you know, <laughs> like you watched the tweet, you know, it showed he didn't really know about Australia's relationship they already had and, you know, he's, He's going to revoke this dumb deal, which the deal was to kind of accept a bunch of Australian um, asylum seekers or refugees. So, yeah, it was pretty interesting, to say the least. And you will continue to have a, an interesting job here and an interesting job when you go home. Uh, you'll probably want to talk to more folks about what's happened the next time you go home. I presume so. If things <laughs> keep going the way they are, yes, I will. Simon, thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for joining us. Join us this week on KRWG Radio. Every weekday, it's Morning Edition, 5 to 9, fresh air at 11, followed by Here and Now, noon to 2, and all things considered, 4 to 7. KRWG News is always online at krwg.org, and we'd love to hear from you. Email us with story ideas and video submissions. The address is feedback at nmsu.edu. Have a great week. We'll see you next time on Newsmakers.